Welcome back to Decouple. Today I'm joined by Ed Conway, who is the economics editor for Sky News and the author of Material World, which is a wonderful book. Um, I've read it actually, I'll say one and a half times, and then I've listened to it as well on, on uh, Audible. Um, it has been shortlisted for the Financial Times Business Book of the Year. Um, and uh, I'm really, really excited Ed, to have you on today to discuss this book. Um, it is this wonderful mix of travel writing, science writing, uh, tech history, geopolitics, tackling themes of environment, sustainability, energy transition. So everything that we love chatting about here on the program, all wrapped up in a beautiful bow. Here it is. <laughs> Rush out and buy it. Um, I usually don't do these kind of silly endorsements off the hop, Ed, but genuinely, authentically <laughs> enjoyed this book. Uh, so thank you for making the time. And why don't you take a, you. a quick moment to flesh out that very brief uh, introduction. Who are you? What do you do? Why did you care so much about this issue to, to devote yourself to this? What is it like a 500, 500 sure, page? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, like, I guess in a way, like, like many of us, I'm a bit of a tourist in this in this kind of land. I, I, I cover, so I'm a journalist. And, and you know, this book is basically it's, it's, it's journalism because I, I'm talking to a lot of people. I'm trying to kind of understand the whole map of this kind of unfamiliar territory, how we make stuff and how it gets into our hands, the kind of amazing conversions and processes things go through to, to become the products we use today. But then that kind of by, by delving into that world, you then start to understand things like the energy transition a lot more. Um, but as I say, this was not my kind of home territory. I I cover economics for a living. I you know I'm the guy who's there uh, at the International Monetary Fund meetings, the G7 G20 meetings. Um, I'm standing in front of the the Bank of England uh, or the Federal Reserve talking about interest rates. So I, I've got like you know a pretty straightforward, prosaic, uh, very conventional journalism existence. And I, I guess I just had this kind of nagging feeling for quite a long time that the kinds of stuff that we're talking about, whether it's gross domestic product, inflation, just like the structure of the economy, didn't really accord with what I knew instinctively. So, you know, if you look at a statistic like GDP, like a massive amount of it is the services sector. And that's kind of what most of us actually do. You know, we, we provide services, whether it's like professional services or, or whatever it might be. And that stuff's kind of like growing like crazy. But it struck me, well, hang on, pretty much everything we do in our lives, you know, whether we're in the services sector or something else, depends at some point on some pretty kind of basic materials. We need concrete to provide the foundations of our buildings. We need steel to keep those buildings going. You need steel, frankly, for pretty much anything, whether it's, you know, for your, for your vehicle, uh, for the transportation system you're using, for hospitals, for tools. We need fiber optics to kind of communicate, you know, so right now we're talking remotely from the other side of the world, thanks to mostly to fiber optics. And it struck me that a lot of this stuff is both physical. Um, and I think we kind of underplay how important physical things are in, in, in the world. We kind of just think, oh, it's just brain power, ideas, AI. That's all that, that, that kind of matters. It's the voguish stuff. And the, but actually, it turns out the physical stuff is incredibly important, and everything else depends on it. So you know, the the kind of the world as we know it, civilization as we know it, really depends on all of these things. You know, that we don't pay that all that much attention to. It depends on concrete. It depends on copper. Um, and so I kind of spend a bit of time, like I guess, delving into that, asking a few kind of simple questions. Okay, like how do we actually make stuff? Which is a pretty kind of primitive question, but it's a good place to start. And, and I just kind of found myself, as I burrowed deeper and deeper, I just and sometimes literally, I found myself just coming across all sorts of different insights and stories that seemed weirdly kind of novel, despite the fact that we, this is what we human beings have been doing for thousands of years. So, but, but the, the kind of, that's the kind of long-winded way of saying it. The book is called Material World, as you say, and it's just a guide to, here are the six materials, and that's not a definitive list, but it's six materials on which we really depend. Sand, salt, iron, copper, oil, and lithium. And it's kind of a beginning point of beginning to try and understand that, that other hidden world. Well, I think it's, it's so timely and important. Um, you know, we are in the midst. I mean, I think it's fair to say we are not in the midst of an energy transi transition in terms of the percentages, uh, in terms of primary energy, certainly, uh, where energy comes from. That being said, we're in the midst of a lot of talk about it and, frankly, a decent amount of policy um, and policy decisions which are 
possibly not being informed by the material world. And, and we're seeing consequences like, you know, the deindustrialization of Germany, for instance. Our policymakers in the West, I mean, there's this, this joke that um, certainly in the U.S., I think there's been some analysis of this. Most politicians are lawyers. In China, most of the Politburo and, and their, whatever their body of representatives are, are engineers. As you're mentioning, you know, in the West, we've transitioned. You know, we're sort of post-material economies, I guess we're told. We're, we're you know, as you mentioned, in, in sort of a service industry. A um, hundred years ago, 150 years ago, we were farmers. We were factory workers. We were construction workers. We, we handled these materials on a daily basis. I think we had a better sense of where things came from. Also, I mean, it's fair to say, I think supply chains back then were a lot simpler, a lot more localized. Um, and so I think your book is just so valuable in terms of, you know, it bringing those of us who, again, do not get our hands dirty every day in this or are part of supply chains, which are far more complex, bringing that that bit of reality forward. I think it's a vital, vital contribution. Um, and, you know, some some of the listeners here are policymakers and, and politicians and folks at think tanks. So, again, that's that's, you know, part of my. Um, giddy enthusiasm uh, about this book and, and about your work here. But the, but the point is, Chris, that we, we never we never stop doing that stuff. You know, that's and I guess that's the kind of wake up call. You know, just because we're not working in the fields anymore, just because we're not down coal mines, just because we're not working in chemicals plants. It doesn't mean that stuff isn't important anymore. It's just that it's kind of out of sight now. And, I, and that's the dangerous thing, because it's out of sight. We've kind of fooled ourselves into thinking, maybe this stuff didn't matter as much. And actually, you could kind of get away with that for, for most of the, the, the second half or, you know, the late 20th century, at least, and the, the first few, the last few decades, you could kind of get away with not having to think about that stuff. You could get away with just having a government that was entirely run by lawyers. Or, you know, in the case of the UK, there's quite a lot of journalists there. Definitely don't trust journalists with anything, I would say that. <laughs> um, but you could get away with that if you could just reasonably assume that it kind of didn't matter where stuff was made that you didn't really have any kind of energy constraints, that st you could just order a, ga a gadget and it would turn up from the other side of the world pretty easily. Um, and I think the kind of interesting thing and the reason this, this book didn't start as a kind of an attempt to try and commit news, but it's, it's become, this, this topic has become more newsworthy in the course of my writing it because, you know, we had the Ukraine, Russia-Ukraine war. We've got what's happening in the Middle East at the moment. You've got what's happening in the Red Sea at the moment. You've got COVID. You've got all of these things which remind people. And, and frankly, a new Cold War, you know, there's what's going on between the US and China. And all of these things are a kind of reminder that, hang on, actually that, that kind of basic stuff, food. How do you get food? How do you keep your house warm? All that basic stuff was always massively important. We just kind of stopped thinking all that deeply as, as certainly within the policy sphere, there's loads of really clever people working on this stuff within within each of our economies. But we kind of just stopped as 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 a as a public to kind of think that much about it, which is fine. You know, it's a sign of success in some ways. But now we're coming into you know this this transition where we set ourselves a lot of really ambitious targets of how we're going to kind of uh, decarbonize, and suddenly you come up against a lot of these constraints and you come up against the, the basics all over again. And so I think we need to, yeah, we need to re-educate ourselves about this stuff mattering. And also, and also the, I think the other thing is to remind ourselves that actually it's kind of an amazing thing that, that we're not working in the fields, isn't it? It's an amazing thing. And how did that happen? It happened because of, you know, amazing uh, machinery. It happened because of steel. You know, some of the first, the first mass produced steel was used to make plows. Um, John Deere. It, it happened because of fertilizers and all of these amazing chemicals that we can make these days. Um, and the problem, I think the kind of difficulty right now is that a lot of that stuff gets very easily demonized. And I can see why a lot of, a lot of the stuff that we make uh, is quite carbon intensive. Um, but we're not going to get to the promised land if we don't try and, you know, embrace uh, the different sectors which are making stuff and try and work out how to do it in a more sustainable way. And right now, I don't think, I don't get the impression a lot of people want to kind of engage with that. It's just a bit too kind of complex and nuanced and they'd rather just say, okay, there's, there's heroes and the villains. Uh, we're the heroes. Let's forget about those villains. Uh, and that's the end of the story. Of course, it's, it's much more complex than that. And actually, when you start to kind of like understand what it takes to keep us fed, what it takes to keep us moving from one place to another, then you realize this is this is more complex, but it's also more, you know, crunchy and interesting, you know. You know, I had an interesting little uh, Twitter exchange the other day. Um, and it was someone had posted a graph of, you know, economic growth in historical context. 
and you see essentially a flat line. I, I, I'm not an economist, you know, probably growth rates of, you know, 0.01% per year for millennia. And all of a sudden you have this, you know, exponential takeoff uh, in the 1800s. And, you know, the, the uh, Twitterer was saying, you know, why is this? Who can explain this? And, you know, I uh, rather hubristically said, you know, duh, fossil fuels. And, um, you know, I, I'm guilty certainly of being an energy maximalist and energy determinist. Um, but I think what this book gave me some perspective on and, and you know, that that, you know, as, as happens in the Twitterverse, that was, uh, you know, bounced back and forth. And clearly there's more there than just energy. And the, the kind of equation that I've that I've been running over in my head is it's materials plus innovation plus energy. All three of those things are required. Um, there's a, an economist, Stephen Keen. Um, he's very critical of, of classical and neoclassical economics. And he says, you know, technology without energy is a sculpture. And, you know, I, I, I sort of retorted with that. But then someone said, well, energy without technology is a fire, right? And so all of these things, there's this dynamic interplay that's re what's required. And I think a good jumping in point to the book is maybe us having a, a bit of an exploration as to why that occurred. You talk about how, for instance, the advances in glass that occurred, I think Venetian glass set up a lot of the science that occurred um, during the Renaissance, you know, and, and also this question of, you know, why was there so much science, um, you know, the scientific revolution occurring in Europe and say not in China, many, many factors and variables there, but some of them had answers in the material world. Um, you know, you mentioned the steel that, that was required and really required for the pressure vessels of the industrial revolution. That technology was being developed. I think steel has its origins in the 13th century. Um, but let, let's talk a little bit about that context. And, you know, we can get back to the energy side of things. But, you know, with, with your expertise in this book, the materials and technology side of, of this extraordinary exponential economic growth, Europe maybe as its center, et cetera. I'll, I'll let you kind of dump it, dive, dive into that rather broad question in any way you see fit. Absolutely. Well, should we start with glass? Because I mean, you know, glass, I, I, I never thought that glass would be so such a fascinating kind of starting point. But it, it, it was, I guess it was always going to be the first chapter of my book, because I wanted to start with sand. Sand is the first of those six materials I deal with. Um, and I kind of as I was writing, it, I was thinking, okay, I need to just kind of get through glass, and then I can get onto the sexy stuff like silicon chips. Because the thing, the thing I definitely wanted to do when I started writing the book was to try and tell the story of where the silicon and silicon chips come from, which is which sounds like, you know, okay, so what? But actually, I, I hadn't ever read anyone trying to explain, trying to cut to, to track that journey of the silicon all the way from the quarry through to the fabrication plant through to inside our phones. And I kind of wanted to know that because I wanted to feel, you know, to touch my phone and think, okay, this came from the ground, but where did it come from the ground? And what happened to it to, to turn it into what it is today? So so I was kind of, you know, very conscious of that. And I thought that glass was just going to be this big history lesson, but actually it turned into one of the most fascinating uh, chapters of the book, partly because like it, it is historical. I mean, you know, glass is, it, it's the first great silicon technology. It's the first advanced technology to some extent that humankind ever, ever made. Um, and yet even today, we're still using forms of glass for, well, we talked about fiber optics. So fiber optics is a form of glass. We're still using glass uh, in those borosilicate vials that contained uh, all of the, the vaccines that went around the world uh, not long ago. We're using glass in the lenses that make those silicon chips. You know, you need extraordinary lenses. Actually, lenses, that the kind of lens um, that we're talking about, these things are, <laughs> they are literally the flattest thing that humankind has ever made. So in order to make a silicon chip, um, with the, these days that, you know, that the transistors and silicon chips, and again, I kind of still, my mind boggles when I think about this, they are so small, the transistors themselves, that they are, they're smaller than a coronavirus. They're smaller than the wavelength of visible light. Like, I, I, you can get that into your head. I, can't, I, I barely can. They are smaller than light. So they are, they are, they are invisible. These, the, the, the transistors are invisible. And the only way you can kind of make them is by using this, uh, technique that, that you know you've you probably heard of and is a bit more commonplace these days uh, extreme ultraviolet lithography and in order to do that you're bouncing this this crazy type of light that doesn't exist in the in the known universe right. or at least in in in, in the world uh, you're you're bouncing that and there's a whole other story about how you create that light which is sci-fi sci in and of itself but you're having to bounce it off all of these different lenses so that you can kind of get it down to a tiny enough uh, dimension to be able to create these to, to basically burn using a, this laser to burn a transistor onto a little piece of silicon. Um, and the lenses you're bouncing it off are so flat 
um, that they are, if you expanded one, they're about the size of kind of, I don't know, like a, like a pizza, a small pizza. But if you expanded one to the size of the continental United States, the biggest deviation upwards or downwards would I think be like a millimeter or maybe less than a millimeter. I can't remember, it's there in the book, but just, just crazy, extraordinary. And, and that's glass and we're still using that glass. That's a particular type of glass. It's a silicon molybdenum glass, but we're still using various forms of glass these days for the very, very most advanced things we can do as, as, as a species. So it's kind of got that, that span. But yeah, when you look at the, the story of glass, it, it's like you said, the, the challenge of making glass, you know, because glass is melted sand, you know, it's a, you need a particular kind of silicon content in that, but it's, it's melted sand, you're just melting it down. But sand has a really high melting temperature. So working out the chemistry and the kind of furnace management you can do, do to, to actually melt down that glass is something that's really hard. And, and for a long time, you know, in the Roman era, glass was so, so valuable. It was so valuable um, because it just took so much work to make it. And it took a lot of expertise. And it took a lot of know-how. And, and over time, the interesting thing is you've got energy there because you need to be able to kind of run the furnaces, but you've got expertise. And the expertise was the, really the tough thing. And the interesting thing looking at, at the kind of at glass is that for a long time, the places that had the best glass manufacture were also the kind of the center points for, for economic activity around the world. So it was Venice, you know, Venice, which was this hub for trade all over the world. They, that was where a lot of the earliest brilliant glassmaking happened. It happened, happened in Murano and Venice. And then the technicians there, and, and the, they were so prized, these, these people working on it, that they were banned from leaving upon pain of death. So they had to stay in Venice. But of course, when you have things like that, then people are going to say, OK, well, I'm going to try and get one of them out. And that's what happened. And a few of them were smuggled out to France. Some were smuggled out to the Netherlands. Some were smuggled to the UK. And then you saw this kind of the diaspora of glass spreading all over the place as expertise spread. And then they were able to kind of to leverage, you know, the different energy, the different techniques, different chemistry. So you need to get hold of the right sand. You need to get hold of the right soda ash, which is generally what you use as a form of flux uh, to try and make this, this happen. And so what you've got is all of these things intermingling at once. You've got expertise. You've got the deployment of different fuels, deployment of different materials. And the upshot of it, at the end of it is we got better and better over time at making amazing types of glass. And by the way, just to, you know, one of my favorite stories, here, again, a slightly historical story, um, is when we think of things like the Renaissance, you know, those amazing kind of uh, 15th, 16th century paintings uh, in Italy and elsewhere, the, the kind of conventional wisdom is, why did this stuff happen? You know, why, did, why was Leonardo able to paint in perspective? You know, why were these early painters in the Dutch golden era able to paint in such perfection you know you went from having quite basic pictures quite beautiful but pretty basic 2d pictures uh, of saints on on a, on a fresco to going to have perspective and the answer for this the most compelling answer for this isn't that people suddenly realize oh let's do perspective you know it wasn't just like some blinding flash of inspiration it was glass they had the lenses to enable them to make the camera obscuras and the various, so they were kind of projecting an image onto the wall and then literally drawing over it or using other contraptions with lenses to beam light down so they could essentially trace out a picture. And people know this because they've looked at the pictures and there are certain artifacts like things going out of focus that simply can't happen if you're, the human eye doesn't go out of focus, for instance. We don't, that's, that's an artifact of, of, of optical um, technology. So the reason the, the Renaissance happened in Italy it wasn't because the Italians were just suddenly incredibly clever. It's because they had the glass because it was coming from Venice. The reason it happened in the Netherlands was because they had the glass because that's where the glass was being made at an amazing kind of uh, level. So you see the, the way that, and, and you could make the same case about various different scientific advancements. You know, someone went through all, I don't know how many it was, but uh, it's, again, it's in the book, like a, a number, 50, let's say, or 40 of the biggest scientific advances in, in, in history, including things like splitting the atom. And they found that I think the vast majority of them, I think 90% or so, relied one way or another on glass, whether it's glass containers, glass prisms, different types of, uh, of glass, you know, glass lenses, you know, tele telescopes and so on, working out that the earth was, was round. All of that, um, it all kind of depended on glass. And so my, my point here is that these materials, we just t tend to kind of ignore them for the most part. And they don't form a part of the story of the Renaissance. They don't form a part of the story of the Industrial Revolution, but they are there. They are absolutely there. And just to go back to your to your question right at the start, you were talking about 
is the industrial revolution and energy revolution. Well, yeah, like that was a massive part of it. And, and actually, economists have come to this relatively late. And so I totally agree with Steve Keen. It's not, it's, it's not there in a lot of the orthodoxy. But there are some economists who have gradually, particularly economic historians, those are the people you want to be listening to. There's a guy called Tony Wrigley, who died just, I think, last year, uh, a British historian who, who I th- think wrote the definitive work on this. Basically, the Industrial Revolution was an energy revolution. Why did it happen in the UK? It happened because the UK was the first place to deploy coal, you know? And actually, there's an interesting environmental story, which takes us on something else entirely, which is why, why, why did the UK, why was the UK before France in doing this? Uh, why was it before other countries around Europe in doing this? It wasn't because it, you know, they necessarily had the know-how. It was because we were forced to do it quite early. And part of the explanation, at least my favourite version, I mean, some people, economists like to talk about how the institutions were the appropriate institutions after the, you know, um, various different kind of, you know, parliament was because strong, you had various forms of intellectual protection. But actually, another explanation, which I think is quite attractive, is the reason it happened in the UK was because we were terrified about deforesting the entire country. So we don't, you know, we don't have as big a landmass as in, for instance, France or in Spain uh, or in Germany, for that matter. Um, and a lot of the trees in the UK were being chopped down to make to turn into into ships. So the masts of, of, of sailing ships at the time. Uh, and to be made into charcoal, which in turn powered the blast furnaces making iron at the time. Um, to the extent that people started to panic, and there's a big debate about whether it was actually happening, but people started to panic that we were going to run out of trees. We were going to deforest the UK. It was an ecological catastrophe. And that forced a lot of people. And there were, you know, the, the Queen at some point said, you can't chop down the trees in this forest and that forest. And so it got, you know, it got serious. Um, and then people had to think, OK, well, in that case, maybe I'm going to have to think of a way of making iron with coal. Maybe I'm going to have to think of a way of making glass with coal, because up until, you know, that kind of period, glass was made in furnaces mostly with charcoal. And so that moment where the UK went and, and, and that, that you know, fed an enormous amount of innovation, which enabled us to run our furnaces with coal, that was a massive moment because suddenly we, we broke free of the kind of organic limitations of our surroundings. So you could power a furnace with something that was pretty much at the time felt like it was limitless because there was so much coal in the ground in the UK. I mean, that, that was the other thing. We were fortunate that we had quite a lot of quite good coal in the UK, anthracite, nice kind of black coal. But the point here is to say, right now we think of coal as being this, you know, it's demonized and understandably so, it's really carbon intensive. Um, but actually coal saved the UK from an ecological catastrophe many hundreds of years ago. And actually a lot of the time, all of these new fuels that eventually get demonized, and again, understandably so, uh, are, are, the res- are the answer to our problems. I mean, oil, when it came along, helped to save the whales because the sperm whale was going to go extinct if it wasn't for the discovery of oil to put in our lamps because you were using, you was using sperm whale oil uh, to power our lanterns. Then along comes oil and, and completely changes things. Um, the you know, elephants were going to go, out, go extinct because we're going to run out of the ivory that we needed for billiard balls and long come plastics and enable you to make the billiard balls out of something that's not ivory or tortoise shell, you know, tortoise shell, tortoises were going to go extinct. So in, in a strange way, um, we, we're pretty good when we kind of come up again. And this should give us some hope for today. Also a bit of kind of, you know, <laughs> ominousness for the future. But we're pretty good at kind of coming up with a solution that then completely changes the game and means we do, we do have a more sustainable world. The problem is that often in that solution, whether it's coal or whether it's oil or who knows, lithium in the future, I don't know, that then there's often the seed of our future ecological catastrophe uh, coming up in, in the future. So, sorry, that's a really long-winded answer, <laughs> but it's, you, see how the, you see how these things kind of intertwine. And, and, and that's why I think when you're thinking about all of these materials, in a way, I was worried when I started writing this book, hang on, I'm not a material scientist. Uh, I'm not a geologist. I'm not, I'm not an expert in energy at all. You know, I was worried that that was going to be a constraint, but in a strange way, it was kind of, it was kind of a liberation because in order to understand this stuff, you kind of want to rove as widely as you can. So you get a holistic picture of the world that we inhabit and it's, and then it just becomes far more fascinating. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's, that answers the question quite well. And, and, you know, the way that this uh, is, glass technology enabled scientists like Boyle to figure out pressure volume 
relationships or yes. Poisson, I imagine, in terms of hydraulics and fluid dynamics. Um, it, it's all there as, as yep. part of the story of materials plus technology plus energy. Um, you know, I'm even, dying. Even nuclear, by the way, I know, yeah. I know that you're, you're like well into nuclear and like, like splitting the atom. When you look at what some of those early uh, scientists were doing, um, the, the Richard Reeves book is, is great on, the, on this uh, making of the atom bomb. Um, Richard Rhodes, sorry. So, so you know, they, they, in their labs, they had glass blowers and, and their ability to, to do the experiments to split the atom. Um, would you know were kind of limited by how many glass blowers they could get to make the vessels they needed to do these experiments. Isn't that amazing? You know, for nuclear technology, all the way into the kind of mid twentieth century. So it's still on it goes. With its it origins back in I think a campfire, a Phoenician campfire, and then through Venice, and then you know with with uh, the incredible German companies, uh, which again make those lenses that you're talking about that make the chips. And I. I the chips was definitely probably the most illuminating chapter for me. And another sort of theme I'd like to delve into with this with this book um, is that of globalization and uh, six continent supply chain and the incredible vulnerability of this whole enterprise that we've built for ourselves. Um, you know, you mentioned the the move to coal being a you know maybe a way to avert ecological catastrophe. And and typically, I think you know, especially as we get more and more post material um, environmental concerns, certainly um, are part of our narrative as to why we take action. But clearly, as you mentioned, these oak trees are required for shipbuilding. This was a national security imperative. This was a, a trade imperative for, a, for the island nation. Um, so I think that's a good jumping off point to, to talk about globalization. We're in this you know, new Cold War, new multipolar world. Um, the Red Sea is, uh, you know, freedom of navigation is, is certainly under threat. Um, and there's all these vital choke points. Um, let's dive into what you call the longest journey. Um, and, and talk about how you get from the quartz mine to the, the silicon chip, which is in the devices which are powering this conversation. And uh, I'm sure it's going to come up, but uh, it's a mine, I believe, in North Carolina, um, South yeah, Pine or something. Pine. Spruce Pine. That's Spruce it. Pine. Yeah, so yeah. Let, I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you. And you can be as long-winded as you want, Ed. I'm, I'm loving this. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, so, yeah, like, like I said, when I, when I started writing this book, I just had this nagging... I guess it started actually. So, so if you if you study economics um, or are interested in economics, there's a great essay that was written in the 1950s. I think it was the 50s by a guy called Leonard Reed called "I Pencil," and it's and the idea is the guy it, it is telling the story of a pencil, just like a simple pencil. It's in the first person, so it's saying "I'm a pencil," and the point is, uh, the pencil says, "I'm a pencil. Uh, I'm one of the simplest things out there, but there is no human being who knows how to make me." And the point there is that. It is the product of so many different, you know, hands. It is the product of so many different materials. You've got the woods that gets chopped down in one part of the world. You've got the graphite that gets comes out of the ground in another. You've got where the eraser comes from, the, the metal on it. Put all of those things together, and actually, it's quite a complex supply chain. Um, and I actually, when I was reading that years and years and years ago, I kind of I found it amazing. I was like, well, that's just I find that kind of so exciting to just understand the complex story of this simple item that we're all touching all the time. I just wish we could do that for more items. And so what I, one of the things, and I kind of do that a little bit for, for, for various things in the, um, in the book, but the one thing I really, really wanted to do it for was a silicon chip. Because, you know, there's been quite a lot written about silicon chips and how they're made in the fabrication plants. And there's a fantastic book about that, Chris Miller's Chip War, which everyone should read, um, about the history of particularly what's going on in those plants where the amazing stuff uh, is happening. But Actually, there's amazing stuff happening even before the silicon has reached that plant. And so I started off, uh, you know, I wanted to basically be in the quarry where the silicon eventually becomes a silicon chip comes out of the ground. And by the way, for all of what we're going to, you know, I'm going to talk about now, it's, it's exactly the same uh, path for solar panels. So, so solar, solar panels are made in basically the same way as silicon chips. They're just a little less pure, but the processes are the same. And we kind of think of a silicon chip as being something that is, is kind of clean. You know, cleanliness is something that kind of comes to mind with it, isn't it? Because especially when you look in those fabrication plants, you know, they are clean rooms. You know, they are some of the cleanest places in the universe. And people are all wearing suits uh, to, to make sure that they're, that uh, none of the stuff coming out of their mouth, you know, could, could interfere with the processes going on there, which that, that's important because there's, you know, a single lone atom getting into your silicon wafer can ruin a chip. Um, However, silicon chips, you know, they are born in a dirty, smoky, 
carboniferous environment. They come out of the ground as a form of quartzite, kind of lumps of quartz, high in silicon, actually a little less pure than the sand used to make um, glass. And then they're thrown into a furnace. And in that furnace, they are, it's kind of an electric arc furnace. So it's the same thing that you use to, to, to make recycled steel these days, a lot of that uh, in North America. And in there, alongside wood chips and coal, they are heated up to you know, one and a half thousand degrees C, incredibly high temperatures, even higher. Um, and there's an extraordinary uh, chemical reaction that happens that basically means what came in as a rock ends as what's known as metallurgical silicon. So it looks like a metal. And, and this and is a lot like, this is a lot that. like, just not to interrupt for too long, but this is a lot like iron where you have uh, hematite totally. and it's bound to oxygen. So you need yes. to strip the oxygen off and turn it into CO2. Is that correct? Yeah, and it's it's smelting. You're smelting it. And, and the reason, by the way, that you often see coal involved at these stages uh, isn't because everyone loves coal. Um, it's because it just so happens that carbon and coal you know, coking coal is usually the one that's used because it's just a really pure form of baked coal. Carbon is just really good at ripping oxygen atoms off something else and getting them out the way. And actually, when you're talking about refining, a lot of it is just kind of getting rid of the oxygen as bonded onto something. So you mentioned iron. When you take, when you look at iron ore, it's kind of like rust, you know, so that's iron plus oxygen, essentially. And you just want to get the oxygen out and then you're left with the pure thing. And it's the same with silicon. You know, we start our, our computer chips, the thing that's enabling us to do so much of economic activity today, computers are at the center of everything and silicon chips are at the center of computers. It begins in a quarry and then it goes to a massive furnace where it is mixed with coal and you cannot make silicon chips and for that matter, solar panels without coal. Even today, the way that we make silicon chips is like that. And we have yet, I mean, people are working on this right now, but we've yet to work out a way of making a silicon, silicon chip without using coal to make the silicon chip. But that's just the start of it. Okay, that's like step one in, in this, yeah, like what I call the longest journey. Um, because after that, then you have to go through an entirely new process. You've got something like 98% pure metallurgical silicon at that point. It looks like a metal, still not pure enough. You need it to be 99.9999999999. I think, I don't know. It's 10 nines, basically. Right. <laughs> and I keep forgetting. It was difficult when I was doing the audio book because I was trying to kind of like count them on my hand as I did them. Uh, it's 10 nines purity. The, basically one of the purest things that humankind has ever made with, with barely a rogue atom anywhere in it. You know, crazy levels of purity. So you take that metallurgical silicon, it goes through another process where it's kind of basically vaporized. Uh, it's called the Siemens process. And then you're, you're, you're left with that super pure silicon that's massively energy intensive as well, by the way. Then even that's not enough because you need to take that super pure silicon. It's super pure, which is great. Okay, that's a start. It might, be, it might even be the purity you need, but it doesn't have the atomic structure you need. Okay, so the silicon atoms are there, but they're in all over the place, basically. It's called polysilicon, polycrystalline. So you've got lots of little crystals all over the place. You need to get those crystals into perfect order, monocrystals. Uh, and so then you need to break it down all over again. You put it into a crucible. Um, you melt it down and then you pull out what's known as a seed crystal. Essentially, you're kind of like, it's almost the best description I have for it. There probably are better ones, but I'm, I was trying to come up with a way that made it seem uh, like it was approachable. It's, it's cotton candy, candy floss. You know, the way that you're kind of pulling out something from a, a, a kind of um, a hot cauldron and then a big thing emerges. Well, it's kind of the same uh, with um, with silicon. And then you end up with this thing that is, it's known as a silicon boule, and it is the most perfect thing. It's the most perfect thing we make. It is so perfect in chemical, chemical uh, purity. It is so perfect in terms of atomic structure that I don't think there's anything else that we make, at least mass produce in the world, that is as perfect. And this, of course, is all way before the silicon has reached that fabrication plant, the bit that we talk about these days. And so there's magic and wonder and also scarcity and pollution in this long, long journey way before it's actually reached the plant. And I, I go on to describe what happens at the plant. And, you know, some of that stuff is, is, is more familiar. But for me, what was kind of unexpected was that bit. And you mentioned um, there's this one mine. So, so a lot of this stuff, you know, get, getting hold of the right kind of quartzite to turn into a silicon chip, you know, there's, there's not many places, but there are certainly enough in the world. The place I kind of describe in the book is in in the north of Spain. Um, and there are a fair few places doing the Siemens process, although actually 
it, it, it's a hard it's hard work to do that. And I describe a place in Germany, but actually a lot of them are in China these days, uh, and there's places in other places in, in Asia as well. But in order to take the polysilicon, so this this is the nine so many nines I I've, I run out, you know, I forget how many nines there are percent pure, but not atomically pure. In order to take that and melt it down and and then turn it into the kind of cotton candy uh, thing that's, by the way, much purer than cotton candy. Uh, so maybe the analogy doesn't work. But anyway, in order to do that, you need to, to melt it down in the crucible. OK, so you're melting it down into a crucible and the crucible that literally just a container, like a kind of bucket, it needs to be so pure that it's not going to introduce any impurities into that thing, because, as you know, by now, purity is kind of one of the biggest things that matters here. And so you need to use something called ultra high purity quartz and ultra high purity quartz is really scarce really, 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 really scarce to the extent that there is only one place on the planet that we know of that can provide kind of large quantities of this stuff. And that, that is a place called Spruce Pine in North Carolina. It's worth saying, you know, well, it's quite scary because it is just that that is, you know, every silicon chip in the world has been in touch with high purity quartz from, from Spruce Pine, North Carolina. If this place went down, a guy, a guy who used to work there, said to me, you know, if someone, if someone flew um, a crop duster plane over this place and, and, and sprinkled a certain type of chemical, it would gum up the machinery and all of the, um, the quarry, basically make that, that quartz unusable. And you would shut down the global economy in six months because you would not have any more silicon chips. You would not have any, it would just be game over. By the way, he, he told me what this chemical was and said, probably best that you don't print that in the book. And I respected that wish. So, yeah. you know, there was a certain amount of responsibility um, there. But like, how, how fragile is the world that we live in? You know, and this is just one of these little pinch points around the world that we all depend on for our everyday lives. We don't think about them much. Very few people kind of know about them. Very few people understand what they are making there and how it feeds into these processes and it is complicated. But there are these little points that we all depend on that, you know, if, if, if they're gone, then we're in big trouble. And spruce pine is one of them. I encounter quite a few of them throughout the course of this book. And I don't know whether to be kind of reassured or terrified by it, but that's the nature of the world we live in. And because we spent so long kind of not looking down, you know, not looking down at the basic stuff that turns simple materials into amazing products. I think we've kind of forgotten about that, both the wonder, because it's so amazing what they're doing, you know, in these plants, but also the, the, the kind of scary thing, which is like, gosh, if, if, if that plant's not there anymore, then we're all, <laughs> we're all in big trouble. Um, and you find that so much because this, this, it's precious, these processes and this stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I like, amazing. I mean, you talk about how ubiquitous these chips are. Again, this is a vital part of the material of the manufactured world. It's present in, you know, your cars and little switches to make your window go up and down, probably in far more important uh, robotic machinery. We mentioned how so many of us, you know, as a percentage of the population used to work in things like factories, farms, construction sites, mines. Part of the reason we don't is because we have all this automation and ultimately chips are vital to that. And you're saying there's, you know, one singular point in the supply chain that could knock all that off course in this um, emerging context of a multipolar world of um, the freedom of navigation of the seas being under threat. Um, I mean, one of the arguments for globalization is that it's a force for peace in how interdependent we are on each other. Um, you know, a, a further blockade of or a true blockade of the Red Sea or the Straits of Hormuz um, or uh, Straits of Malacca. These are all major, major geopolitical issues that would force us into war. But the price to be paid would be so extreme because of the interdependence. That's part of what seems to keep us out of war. So, I mean, maybe if you want to riff on that for a second, uh, it's not something I think that you cover at, per se within the book, but I'm sure, I'm sure you've been thinking a lot about this. Yeah, no, and I, I kind of, I, I, I nodded it a little bit um, towards the end in the conclusion because there are, it is, you know, like... It is, it is both scary and reassuring at the same time. I, I, I think the first thing to say is, I don't think it is as widely appreciated as it should be just how interconnected we all are. So when you look at trade statistics, again, go back to those conventional statistics, they are massively underplaying the extent to which there is a little tiny bit of 
for instance, China or the US or Canada or the UK in certain devices. We underplay it. We underplay how globalized the world is. It's not there. It's not evident in the data. Um, we Our visibility of supply chains for anything, for anything is, is, is primitive. It's massively primitive. I'll give you a like, quick example. This is not in the book, but it's, it's, it's in, in the course of my kind of day job, I went to this factory in, just outside Birmingham in, in the UK, in the Midlands, kind of old, old manufacturing place, uh, where they, they used to make the nibs that go on, went on pens when, it, when they were kind of fountain pens back in the day. But these days they make, they make very, very precise kind of, you know, uh, micron accurate, accuracy bits of metal. So they're really good at pressing steel and various other types of metal. And they were making, actually, at the time that I was there, they were making a certain type of electrode. Uh, and I was like, well, what's that electrode for? And they said, well, this, is, this electrode goes into the rear view mirror of your car. And it's the thing that does the auto dimming. OK, so, you know, you don't get the glare uh, when someone flashes their lights be behind you. It's that auto dimming. And most almost most mirrors have this around the world today. You know, it's a minor thing, but you know, pretty important. Um, and I said, well, OK, how, how many of these are you turning out uh, each year? And they said well, hundreds of millions. And it turns out, actually, this little factory in Birmingham that no one's heard of is making more than 50 percent of all of the electrodes that go into rear view mirrors all around the world. So, you know, there is a better than evens chance that the car you're driving has a little bit of that Birmingham factory in it. And this shows up nowhere. And this is one teensy, tiny, teensy bit of a teensy part of your car that no one thinks about. And it's obviously, you know, the fact that it's in the UK is kind of interesting to me because everyone in my country assumes we don't really make anything anymore. But you can just, you can pretty kind of lazily and easily assume there's going to be a bit of China in there, there's going to be a bit of, there's going to be a bit of all of these different countries. And nowhere is that kind of accounted for. And I think that here in, you know, in the, in the West, you know, in, in North America, the UK, Europe, I think we have not taken enough account of that for years and years. I think in China, they have been thinking in these terms for quite a long time. They've been thinking about where stuff comes from. They have strategies that are designed, because, partly because they're, you know, they wanted to focus on manufacturing as much as they could. That was part of their economic story. So in China, I think they are more aware of this. But the upshot of all of this, as you, as you say, Chris, is that you know, if there is a breakdown in, in you know, diplomatic relations, if we are going to see more sanctions in the future, the consequences will be grisly. They will be really, really much more dramatic, I think, than you would guess from the economic numbers. And I say that, I mean, like, that's a bit of a guess. Who can know for sure? But I, I, I did note that, like, when, for instance, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, when we had, uh, you know, a big, massive spike in energy prices uh, in Europe in particular, but to some extent around the world, um, economists massively underestimated the extent to which that was going to feed into everyone's lives, into, into inflation. Initially, they did. They, they, they later then kind of were like, oh, hang on, this is a big deal. But I think in much the same way that we underplay how important energy is to everything, I think we underplay how important these interrelationships of different parts whizzing around the world all the time. And that, we, you know, that silicon chip, before, before the silicon wafer that becomes a chip arrives in its fabrication plant in Taiwan, it's probably been around the world a few times already. You know, so everything, even the basic, well, seemingly basic, it's not that basic, a silicon wafer, even those ba basic materials are whizzing all over the place all the time. And, and were that stuff to, you know, to, to stop or to be interrupted, we'd, we'd find a way to go on, but it would be it would be quite a bumpy and difficult ride. And I hope that the policymakers on, you know, on all sides are, are, are aware of that. I think they're becoming more aware, like in the UK, I know, I know the government is much more interested in this stuff than it was only a few years ago. Uh, I know because they occasionally kind of, you know, they show some interest in, in, in my work. Uh, and the same thing on, in the US, you know, you look at the CHIPS Act, look at these different pieces of legislation. What are they trying to do? Partly they're trying to support American manufacturing, but actually partly they're also just trying to understand the nature of supply chains so that they can start to, you know, not just necessarily, not just to intervene, but just to, to work out where the frailties are going to be uh, in the future. So I think, I think we are getting better at starting to understand this stuff, but we are starting pretty much from scratch in this side of the world. Uh, and a lot more work needs to be done. I want to riff a little bit off of, uh, you mentioned the fountain pen, and it reminds me, I'm not sure if this is from your book or somewhere I, I picked it up elsewhere, but uh, this kind of national shame in China 
of the ballpoint pen, I believe. Oh, know, yeah, that's higher book, up. Yeah. yeah, if you could tell that story. And I mean, it's just so interesting. And maybe you can tie it into China's attempts now to um, access um, the the knowledge in the same way that the French and the Dutch, um, you know, managed to attract some of those uh, Venetian glass blowers. Um, China's attempts to, um, you know, uh, become more uh, independent in terms of its supply chains. Um, you mentioned in the book that China spends more on silicon chips than oil imports, and oil is the lifeblood of the economy. That statistic blew me away. But start ballpoint pen, and then jump over to uh, China's attempts to uh, build up its own uh, chip manufacturing basis um, and and the difficulties that it's having and why. Yeah, well, the story the story is it's in one of the chapters on iron. Um, again, you know, for a lot of people, iron is the kind of less sexy bit of of all these materials. They love silicon chips and they love lithium ion batteries, but actually, actually, boring old steel is incredibly important. Uh, there's a, the story goes that a few years ago, the Chinese premier um, went to the World Economic Forum in Davos uh, and was signing some sort of document, or maybe was taking notes on his pad. And he kind of realized that the pen that he was using was just lovely. You know, the ink was flowing smoothly. It was a pleasure to write on. And he kind of came away from it saying, hang on, why? And then he looked and he noticed that the pen was, I think, made in Europe. And he kind of came away and said, well, hang on. Why is it that we can't make these things in China? All of our ballpoint pens are really kind of scratchy. The ink doesn't flow as uh, uniformly. Uh, And it turns out that, you know, making the kind of ball bearing and the socket that go into a ballpoint pen, really tiny stuff, is hard, is hard, you know? And a lot of China's skill at making things, at that point at least, has changed a lot since. A lot of their skill at making things was, was the kind of big, brutish, less micron accuracy stuff. So kind of not like the, the place I mentioned at, outside of Birmingham. Um, and uh, the amazing, I guess the amazing thing there is that a couple of things. First of all, China's been really focused on this and in the course of the following years, they put so much money into trying to make that ultimate ballpoint pen. And then eventually, and you know, people in the meantime, the, the, the various different kind of steel manufacturers in the country were kind of brought onto national television and shamed for not being able to make good enough ballpoint pens and ball bearings. Uh, but at the end of it all, I, I, I don't know how many years ago, but kind of, you know, it took, it took a good few years. Um, and it's relatively recently, they were able to proclaim, look, we have now a domestic Chinese manufactured ballpoint pen. And what is that? And like, people don't think of the ballpoint pen as being a, this extreme, you know, advanced manufacturing, but it really is. It's really hard to, to make these things. But the interesting thing there is that China has been trying to go up the value ladder Okay, so starting to by making kind of things that are relatively basic steels that could be used in rebar, um, you know, reinforcement bars rather than uh, highly structured or armored steels, and then gradually refining their ability to make stuff. And part of the part of how they've done that is by kind of investing a lot of money in it. Part of how they've done that is by buying up European and American companies and just kind of bringing the technology across to to China. So, you know, they, they literally bought up one of the biggest steelworks in Germany, and trans- transported it brick by brick to China, the steelworks. So supposedly there are still signs in German in some of these steelworks in China, uh, because that's where it all kind of came from. Um, but the, the same thing has happened with kind of more advanced manufacturing. I mean, look at, look at um, SAIC, which is a very big Chinese car manufacturer. They bought MG, which is a, a big, uh, MG Rover, it's a UK uh, car company, not not it was very down at hill, not doing very well, but it had quite a lot of expertise in, in in car design and also engine manufacture, and they just bought it and took pretty much all of the technology back to China. And now MG, admittedly with electric cars rather than uh, petrol cars for the most part, is becoming an enormous uh, car maker these days. In fact, one of the, you know one of the, the big stories these days is that China is so dominant in battery manufacture that it is. It is way ahead of everyone else when it comes to making electric cars. Um, way ahead, you know. Like some people would look at that and they say China has already won when it comes to batteries. They've won when it comes to solar panels. They won a long time ago, but they won when it comes to batteries. And part of how they've done that is is just like a lot of investment, uh, a lot of capital spending, um, and we, it's left us in the world we are in today, which is actually America trying to catch up on batteries, trying to catch up on solar panels. And I don't know if I don't know if America will be able to. It's even worse in Europe, actually, because in, in Europe, you know, people talk a good game about wanting to, to electrify the European car uh, market. And the thing and, and the thing is that, you know, 
Europe and the US had a big lead on China. The interesting thing, actually, up until about kind of five, six years ago, was that when you look at car manufacturing across the world, the striking thing was, where was China? It was nowhere. And part of that is because in the same way as making a ballpoint pen is quite difficult, making an engine is really difficult. An engine is part, you know, this, this, this um, complex of all of these different moving parts made in precise forms out of steel with explosions happening throughout. Making an engine is really hard, a, a reliable engine, uh, internal combustion engine. Making an electric car is actually much easier in certain forms. But you're, you're, it's a different kind of thing. You're going from, you know, uh, kind of physical manufacturing of, uh, uh, with, with, with engines to a form of kind of chemical manufacturing. Um, and China just invested big time in that. They kind of like agreed that they were going to lose the race when it came to making petrol cars, and they just couldn't get anywhere close to Europe or America. But when it comes to electric cars, they've been investing more in that over the last kind of 10 years than, than, than we have. And as a result, they are way ahead. And in Europe right now, um, China is utterly dominant when it comes to electric cars, you know, utterly dominant in the UK when it comes to electric cars. The, they've gone from being kind of nowhere in terms of the, the list of biggest providers of, of cars in the UK to being one of the biggest. It's going to soon overtake Germany, I think, which is a a monumental moment. Um, and that is because they've been very strategic about this. You know, they've got their plan and they've stuck to it. And you can raise lots of questions about, about you know, the, the, the economy and the country and the way it's being run and the, the, the lack of democracy and so on and so forth. But in terms of the economics, in terms of thinking about supply chains, China is way, way ahead of us. Uh, and yeah, they have been long, even before the ballpoint pen, but that was just like a kind of a nice example of how fixated they've been on on making stuff better over time. I mean, we could stick on any of these topics for for hours, um, but I, I do want to move through a few more themes. Um, <clears throat> the copper chapter, I thought, was very illuminating from the perspective of this question of sustainability. We're seeing um, copper ore grades dropping dramatically from the Bronze Age, shall we say. Um, and even from the early uh, 21st century up until now, um, you have some great um, ways of, of understanding how Julian Simons, the famous economist who made the bet with uh, Paul Ehrlich about the prices of, of various commodities, where they'd be in 10 or 20 years, um, and how that came true. You tie in, I believe, the Carnegie's moving steam shovels from the Panama Canal in terms of increasing the productivity of these mines as the ore grades go down. If you can tell that story, and then I'm, I'm eager to ask a follow-up question. Yeah, well, I guess it's, it comes back to something kind of broader, which is like when we talk about things like the Industrial Revolution, we, 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 we kind of forget that it was happening in so many different dimensions at the same time. So it wasn't just that we were kind of, you know, getting better at making textiles. It wasn't just that we were kind of getting better at making steel. We were also, and it wasn't just that you had things like Henry Ford working out mass production of, of automotives. We were at the same time doing the same thing elsewhere for chemicals, for, for different forms of, of, of refining and for mining. And mining became, it's, it's one of the least told stories in economics. It became completely revolutionized around the turn of the 20th century. It went from being something where it really was about, you know, going down underground with pickaxes or with shovels and things like that. And a lot of people had to work in it. It was incredibly dangerous to being all about blasting massive holes in the ground. And partly that was helped by the fact that around the same time, and the interesting thing, I guess, about this book and all of the different materials that I've tried to cover is how much they intertwine. So so I cover fertilizer as one of the the, the materials in there. It's not the one of the six, but it, I keep coming back to it. And fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer, is basically the same thing chemically as explosives, you know, TNT. And it was because of the discovery of how to make explosives in large quantities, first from minerals, but then from... Uh, from chemical processes, uh, the harbour wash process, that enabled miners to just blast even bigger holes in the ground uh, and have even bigger trucks taking them out. Um, and so mining, I guess, I guess part of what that underlines is there have been so many times throughout history where people have said, well, hang on, we're going to run out of this. You know, whether it's, whether it's gold, whether it's oil, whether it's coal, whether well, it's copper. Uh, and each time it hasn't happened. And there was a big bet that was made between two economists. Well, actually, one was an economist, Gideon Simon, and the other was Paul Ehrlich, who was not an economist. He was actually 
I think like an insect specialist, but he's, he's, I think he's still going today. And he's, he, he certainly he, thought he humans were insects, <laughs> a plague of locusts. Yeah, he, was not, he wasn't a fan. The population. He bomb. was not a fan of, of, of humans. Yeah. It's clear from his book. He wrote a book called the population bomb, um, which essentially is saying there's just too many people on the planet. Um, and one of the things he thought is that, yeah, there are too many people on the planet. We're going to ruin the planet. We're going to run out of stuff. Uh, and that was around the time of the 1970s. And a lot of people were getting very nervous about things. And, you know, there's these, there's, there's this great website, which is called like what happened in 1971. Uh, what the hell happened in 1971? One of, one of the things that happened, actually, I've got a few theses about that because I, I, my previous book that I wrote was about the Bretton Woods Agreement. And I think part of the explanation is that we, um, uh, that the international monetary system that was presiding over us completely changed. And, and there's, a, there's a long, we could talk for, for many hours about that. However, another thing that was happening in the 1970s is the whole, we kind of shifted from optimism to pessimism about our future. And you had, you know, and understandably so, there were a lot of people very, very worried about the environment, very worried about our place within it. Um, and a lot of people thought we were going to, you know, the population bomb became very popular because people thought that we were, we were ruining the planet and we were going to run out of stuff. So there's, you've got two, two separate things. We're ruining the planet, we're going to run out of stuff. And Paul Ehrlich had a, a bet with Julian Simon, this economist. And this, the economist Julian Simon said, listen, we're not going to run out of stuff because we're really good at substituting materials. So if, if ever we started to run out of copper, for instance, we'd find something else to use instead. Uh, and that's kind of half true because we would do that if we started to run out of it. And they, they had a bet with each other. And the bet was basically over the next, I can't remember how many years, um, I think that prices are going to go up for all of these materials because we're going to start to run out of them. That's what Paul Ehrlich was saying. And Julian Simon was saying, no, I don't think so. The prices are not going to go up because we're going to be really kind of clever and work out new ways of getting hold of them. And in the end, Julian Simon won the bet. Um, but he didn't, here's the interesting thing. He didn't win the bet because we kind of substituted away from copper, or at least we, 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 to some extent we did because we use a bit more aluminium. But for the most part, we, we are mining much copper now than we ever were before. And the reason for that, and the reason that we haven't run out of it, and the reason actually that the price of copper has stayed really low, comes back to what we were saying a second ago. We have just got better and better at blasting ever bigger holes in the ground and processing ever bigger amounts of copper ore so that what previously was uneconomical, so rock that was under 1% copper was just previously regarded as uneconomical, too expensive, to grind, to blast it, to grind, transport it, to grind it, to refine it, all of those things. Because the scale of all of this has gone up so much, because we've got so much better at doing it, under 1%, sub 1% ore is now viable. Um, and that, that, you know, in some ways, people talk about things like Moore's Law, this amazing productivity that means that every few years you get a new jump in the transistor density in different semiconductors. It's a form of productivity that everyone can agree is kind of an amazing thing. But actually, there's another form of productivity, which is every year, the quantity of man hours you need to get a certain kind of tonnage of copper out of the ground goes down. And the price of copper as a result stays low, and we are able to get even more of it out of the ground. So there is something kind of amazing about that, a productivity miracle that we, we don't talk about enough. But of course, there's a flip side to the miracle, which is that also we've got bigger holes. And, you know, we're using more water and more energy for every ton of copper that we're getting out of the ground uh, as well. So it's not to say there aren't constraints. It's not to say that things are not, you know, finite, which of course they are. You know, there is only so much copper in the ground. But we are really, really, really good at improving the rate at which we're getting stuff out, which is part of the story of human progress. Right. You know? Which it brings me back to the equation I was sort of positing at the beginning, um, you know, and, and in terms of being able to process more and more or, as you mentioned, more ammonium nitrate, blow bigger holes in the ground. Um, we we're talking or the kind of, you know, I was suggesting we have materials, technology and energy. And those are sort of the vital interplay of those three ingredients. If they're ever increasing and improving. We have things like the Industrial Revolution and exponential economic growth. Um, and, you know, the energy added to the equation to make up for a declining resource grade for dropping ores um, was, I think, ultimately the explanator that makes the difference in addition to superior um, technologies to extract the ore chemically. Um, and so you have natural gas fueling the Haber-Bosch process, which I think it consumes, you know, a few percentages of all global primary energy. It's a very important process proteins in our body um, and the ammonium nitrate to get at these ores. 
Um, also, again, I think you told the story. It's it's one of the major American uh, billionaire families. I think it was the Carnegies who brought steam shovels um, from the recently dug Panama Canal down. Were able to move even more ore. But you get the picture. Applications of greater yeah. amounts the of Guggenheims. energy. It was the Guggenheims. The Guggenheims. Yeah. So ever ever increasing um, use of of you know more abundant and cheaper energy to make up for a declining ore grade. And I guess you know the concerns I have when we start thinking in terms of sustainability and looking into the future. Either we have, and I think we're starting to see this, you know, just as we've accessed the best first when it comes to mineral ores, we've accessed the best first when it comes to deposits of fossil energy. Um, and we're starting to see potentially declines there. I mean, prices are still stable, but there's people that talk about, you know, peak cheap oil, for instance, being a major constraint. And you have a chapter on oil. Um, but, but all this to say that, um, you know, the, the, the other potential constraint we have on energy is a voluntary um, disuse or, or ceasing of using of fossil fuels, which I'm a little more skeptical about. Um, but, you know, in any case, we have fossil fuels. I mean, there's a great uh, quote I like to, to make about the sheer volume of, of energy. Again, you know, the world is material blind. It's also energy blind. But this idea that, you know, a barrel of oil contains 1700 kilowatt hours. If you do the math and, and make some efficiency sacrifices to compare that to the amount of human labor you could put out with that energy, it works out to sort of four to five years of human labor. We use 100 billion er barrel of oil equivalents every year. So we essentially have this workforce of, depending on the efficiency conversions you want to make, 400, let's say 400 billion slave laborers that can, can move this process forward, can shovel that ore symbolically, et cetera, right? Um, so do you, do you have concerns, I guess, um, in terms of that Julian Simons bet, if we project it into the future and energy becomes more scarce, becomes lower quality, or we voluntarily decide not to use it, um, is that sort of the end of, um, of, of, of prosperity, the end of that exponential growth curve in terms of economic growth? I know it's a big question. I'm sorry, it's a bit meandering, but really wanted to, uh, to pose that to you. No, it's a great, it's a great question. Um... Like my the thing the thing that does make me nervous is you know if you define this moment we're in right now if you define this moment right now we are there have been various different energy transitions throughout history um, we've gone from wood to coal from coal to oil from oil to gas to nuclear and in each of those transitions we've gone to a more energy dense fuel and that has been enormous so so the work has got easier. As we have gone along, we've, we're climbing up a thermodynamic ladder. The challenge with the energy transition is a couple of challenges. First of all, we go down the ladder. Okay, if we if you're shifting from you know from fossil fuels to renewables, I mean nuclear is another conversation. We're shifting from fossil fuels to new uh, to to renewables. Then you're going from something like kind of oil, uh, which is very high in terms of its energy density, to something like a lithium ion battery. Obviously, it's a storage it kind of Thing, but you're you're storing the kind of renewable energy in there, which is very low energy density. So going down that short thermodynamic ladder, I, we haven't had an energy tr transition which has involved going to a less dense fuel. And so there is something unprecedented there. What's also unprecedented is the time that we have set ourselves to do it. So previous energy transitions, you know, like so you could argue that we're still in the coal transition right now. Maybe not coal, but definitely oil. We are still in the oil energy transition right now. And it's been going on for about 150 years, you know, since those early discoveries. And we're, and we're using more and more of it every so. year, not less and less. <laughs> and we're using more and more of it. And, 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 you know, no one is expecting realistically for it to peak until, you know, for the end of this decade. But that even might be optimistic. You know, when I look at, there's two, there's two charts that I find kind of interesting because it's telling a kind of maybe telling the same story. One of the charts is showing uh, it's the International Energy Agency's forecast for solar panel deployment. And basically every year they forecast it for it to be more or less flat and it goes up. And every year uh, it, it, it's, it defies them on the upside. So it's a great news story. It's like, oh, look at these pessimists. You know, they're under, underplaying the, the extent to which solar deployment has happened. But then there's another chart, similar kind of thing. There's, these are forecasts of coal consumption. And each year, it's forecast to peak. So we stop producing as much coal. But each year, it defies it. And each year, we produce more and more coal. And actually, go back to our previous conversation about how you make a, a semiconductor or a solar panel. You make it with coal. You know? <laughs> You're using coal to, in those, to provide the energy in those processes. You're using coal in the furnace. You throw coal into the furnace as a chemical agent to get rid of the oxygen. Now, this that's not, you know, that's not all of China's coal use. It's a tiny sliver of it. 
But nonetheless, it's a kind of totemic example of the fact that we have built out the stuff that we are using uh, for the energy transition to make the world cleaner with coal, you know, made, made in China. Um, not, nothing wrong with that. And in the long run, OK, if you look at life cycle analysis, you know, a solar panel clearly has a lower carbon footprint than, than a coal fire power, power station kind of burning coal for, for, for many years. But even so, the things are kind of intertwined. Um, so I, I am nervous about the fact that um, we, we are pushing ourselves into a kind of less energy dense set of uh, raw materials. But we're doing it, you know, with good reason. We're doing it because we want to have a cleaner environment. We want to have a healthier environment. Um, we are still deploying fossil fuels, but we're using them in the future potentially to make stuff rather than to burn them. Um, if we make enough of that stuff, like wind turbines, uh, then, you know, in theory, we could have a lot more energy, but it involves a massive, massive, massive deployment of materials, far greater, I think, than most people have quite realised. Um, and so I, I kind of, I, I veer between desperate depression and optimism. Um, and I, I guess I veer between them because, like, on the one hand, this, this is a challenge that is probably the greatest challenge that humankind has ever set itself. You know, we should not lose sight of that. And I think we do lose sight of it and we underplay that. But by the same token, you know, our ability to innovate is just amazing. And you read this book, you read my book, I think, and you're left with the feeling that we've done amazing things in the past. A lot of those technologies that we've, you know, we've talked about, whether it's kind of making silicon chip transistors so small that they are invisible, these things were thought to be impossible People denied that it was ever going to happen, you know, and it took some crazy scientists at this, this place, ASML, to, to work out how to do it. There's so many things throughout history that are like that, where people at the time said, it's just, you're just never going to be able to do it. And humankind's managed to do it. So I kind of cling on to that. Um, my concern, though, more broadly, is that when you look at a lot of the kind of models for how we get to net zero, like the International Energy Agency and places like that, there's two things that I get worried about. First of all, broadly across the, the world, they are expecting energy consumption to basically plateau. And again, we, we've never done that. And yes, we can be more efficient. So there's kind of promising reasons. You talk about that barrel of oil. We waste so much of that barrel of oil as heat. You know, it doesn't actually become useful energy. So, you know, in theory, that's, that's not quite as much of a problem as it, as it was in the past. But I do go, you know, think of what happened in 1971. For a long time, productivity, economic productivity progress was basically closely intertwined with how much extra energy we can deploy to get to do things. You know, look at Concord. It was massively energy inefficient, but it allowed us to go really fast. And then it turns out that, you know, supersonic flight was really, you know, not a very efficient way of travel from one side of the planet to another. So that kind of went uh, the way of the dodo. Um, I do worry that, that we've become kind of energy averse. And energy is, is a good thing. Energy is a good thing. You know, it has made us wealthier. It has made us healthier in the past. Yes, carbon intensive energy is something we need to, to, to mitigate and find, find a way of doing less of that while also having energy. But the energy itself is great. We need energy. And we need to be focusing more on energy abundance, which is kind of a lazy thing to say. But I think that we need all to be kind of reminding ourselves of that because things like the, the net zero frameworks that we have do not provide us with energy abundance, it's the opposite. And the second thing about those frameworks that I get really worried about, it's not just the overall number for the world as a whole, it's the distribution. And one of the things you all have noticed, you know, I kind of bang, bang on about a bit in the book, is these materials, the resources we have are not evenly distributed. I mean, I don't mean stuff in the ground. I mean, you know, having having the copper you need to have the wires to have electricity in your home. I mean, Steel having clean drinking water. I mean. Yeah, stuff per capita, steel per capita. Um, the amount of steel that we have, you know, in our in our worlds, in the U.S., uh, in North America, in the U in Europe, it's about fifteen tons per capita. So in my car, in my public transportation system, my hospital, the rails I take on, you know, uh, on the train to, to get to work, um, fifteen tons per capita. In sub-Saharan Africa, it's zero point one tons per capita. And who are we to say that people in sub-Saharan Africa can't aspire to have the same level of steel per capita as we do in the developed world? And yet, when you look at all of these different frameworks about how we're going to get to net zero, there is no explanation about how we're going to deal with that. I think it is like dealable with, 
but we are nowhere near coming up with a framework to deal with that. And that's particularly kind of worrying when you think about the fact that there is no way of mass producing steel right now without an almighty amount of carbon emissions. So on that, I've been thinking about steel a bit recently because we're, we're shutting down a couple of our glass furnaces in the UK. You know, glass furnaces are really carbon intensive. To give you an idea of this, okay, about seven or eight percent of global carbon emissions, global carbon emissions, way, way more than and think aviation is, I think, like two or three percent. So all the planes in the world is about two percent. Steel is seven or eight percent. Basically, all of that seven or eight percent comes from 500 places. So there's five, there's about 500 blast furnaces around the world, which are responsible for about the biggest chunk of carbon emissions. There is nowhere on the planet that produces more carbon as these places. And that is how we make steel. And that is how, you know, places like Europe have been able to get to 15 tonnes of steel per capita. But in the future, if places like sub-Saharan Africa are going to get to a reasonable level of steel per capita, maybe even not 15 tonnes, maybe kind of more like seven tonnes per capita, you're still talking about having to produce more steel than we have ever produced in the history of humankind. And there is no good explanation that I've encountered yet about how we do that without lots more carbon emissions. And when you talk to people in China or India, parts of sub-Saharan Africa, they say, well, it's just outrageous that, you know, that we're being told that we need to limit our future pollution just because it's inconvenient, because it doesn't fit with the, the carbon modelling that uh, places like the IEA have put into, into place. And it's, this is a really awkward thing. We, we've got the right intentions. We want to reduce carbon emissions. We don't want the planet to, to, to have a catastrophe. So it's all done with good faith. But you can see how a lot of people on the other side of the world, you know, particularly in, global, I guess, the global south, as some people call it, you see a lot of people there think this is, this is hypocrisy. Um, and I think it's actually quite hard to come up with a compelling answer, frankly, uh, to them. I just think a lot of people, as with so much else that, that we deal with in this book, it's just it, when something is awkward, <laughs> you just prefer not to look at it. So we don't look at the stuff that's, that's, you know, the materials. We don't look at these knotty questions, but we need to. Gosh, we need to if we're going to if we're going to get there. Yeah. I mean, to me, this is kind of deadly serious. Um Hans Rosling uh, famously said, you know, human beings never lived in harmony with nature. We died in harmony with nature and mostly children under five and women in childbirth. You know, the average woman used to give birth, I think, to six children. 2.2 survived to have a steady population. Uh, there you had it. And, you know, GDP and population growth um, were pretty flat. So that meant three or four kids per family were dying. And then, you know, we had this uptick in GDP, but that also correlates to population uh, to materials use almost perfectly. Um, and, you know, to levels of health being the number one determinant of health as a medical doctor, that's obviously uh, of, of some concern to me. And ultimately, you know, again, that equation of uh, materials, energy, technology, um, these are the enablers of the carrying capacity we have right now, which in many ways, environmentalists might look at and say, this is unsustainable. But if we don't maintain that carrying capacity, then lots of people die or have to die to get back in so called harmony with nature. I guess my concerns in terms of uh, this question of energy transition, you know, you mentioned moving to lower density sources, and that's certainly one uh, window through it to, which to look at it. And of course, nuclear is kind of heading in a different direction there. Um, but there's also this question of sort of, um, and this is probably I'm going to get some cr criticisms from some of my engineering uh, uh, audience, but this idea of low entropy materials, so, you know, high ore grades, low entropy energy in terms of, you know, coal, gas, oil, um, and what we're doing with this energy transition to renewables is we're taking really high quality, low entropy fuels and through a process involving materials, energy technology, we're transforming them into very high entropy sources of energy, stochastic production of basically just electricity, maybe a tiny bit of heat with uh, some concentrated solar production, et cetera. Um, but we're making, you know, lower energy return, energy invested uh, sources of energy, um, again, uh, fairly unreliable and, and electricity only. So, you know, as part of that fundamental equation that enables carrying capacity, the fact that we're sacrificing energy is a major concern. On the other side, you know, I, I come from this sort of nuclear advocacy side and that's trying to answer this question of, okay, if we have decreasing ore grades um, and hopefully we can, we can increase our technological innovation, if we are running short on fossil fuels or we should phase them out, if renewables are too great of a sacrifice in terms of energy quality, well, let's just do lots of nuclear. And, and I hear people saying, you know, with, and it's kind of this too cheap to meter fantasy and narrative of, you know, it's limitless, clean, abundant energy. 
And it's just not. I mean, I've, I've had my nose in this for quite some time at the policy level. It's a great source of energy. It doesn't replace all of all the fossil fuel services. It's not going to help us in terms of supply chains, transportation, moving people and goods around the world like liquid hydrocarbons do. And also, it's just really hard to build. When, when we've had the necessity to do it, we've done amazing things like France, you know, bringing 54 reactors online in 20 years or something like that. But it's hard. So, you know, I'm, I'm struggling to stay out of the doomer side. I mean, side. literally just... just... Right now, right now, I mean, just uh, in the UK, they've just announced that Hinkley C, which is this new nuclear power plant, I mentioned it briefly, that's going to be delayed, you know, by another few years. It's costing, I think, like five times or more, like what it was originally expected to cost. And that's that's being built by the French, you know, it's built by Electricité de France. Um, and so something like yeah, it is not cheap, and 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 something has gone wrong there. I like I didn't. If I had had more space, I probably would have had uranium as one of the materials in here, and then I'd know a bit more about nuclear. So I'm, <laughs> I'm by no means an expert in this. Maybe the next book, but like yeah, it is. It's it's clearly not as simple as that. And I think the thing that I struggle with is with this energy transition. You always encounter people who 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 are cheerleading for one or the other of these things. You get cheerleaders for hydrogen. You get cheerleaders for for renewables and batteries, and you get cheerleaders for nuclear, and it's quite hard to kind of, you know, to to find an honest broker between them, isn't it? Because like there's a it's lobbying, understandable lobbying, um, and so this is the difficulty. But I think by the same by the same token, I quite like the fact that we, at least within these various different worlds, we're talking about kind of technology and engineering, and. We have an engineering challenge in front of us. And although this is the greatest challenge that we humanity has ever set itself, I really believe that. Um, that that that's quite kind of exciting. There were quite a lot of innovations that happened throughout history, particularly um kind of the 19th century, 18th century, that happened because someone, usually the king, a lot of the time it was like the king of France, decided that they wanted to have a certain challenge answered. You know, they wanted to be able to make soda ash from, from salt. And then they had a competition and someone kind of was was able to answer it. And I feel like we're kind of going through something similar at the moment, um, albeit on a gargantuan, you know, far greater scale. Um, so yeah, but anyway, I interrupted you. I mean, it's true, nuclear is not is not answering all of the, the you know, it's, it's very promising in certain respects, but it's not quite as simple as all that, is it? Ed, I'm, I'm, I want to be respectful of your time. And I sincerely hope I'll be able to beg you back uh, for a second episode, because so many more questions to ask. Um, we didn't really touch on salt. That was a fascinating chapter. Um, I mean, obviously a big role in water sanitation in the chemicals industry, um, one of the earliest industries. Um, so I, I would love to have you back to talk a little bit more. Um, and you can't make silicon chips without salt or lithium ion batteries. You still need the chemicals we get from salt. It's right, everywhere. Right, right. And I mean, this book is just so drenched with, um, you know, incredible writing, frankly, um, with so many factoids. Um, just one that I had on the list here, you know, human beings as a force of the Anthropocene, we um, move 24 times more, you know, uh, earth, soil, rocks through mining, quarrying, dredging, plowing fields than all of the earth's natural erosive forces. Um, the book is just dripping with these kind of factoids, uh, but told in a way that, you know, I'm a big fan of Václav Smil. His most recent book, How the World Works, is the most readable Václav I've come across. Um, and all respect yes. to that, yeah, that man. Um, but you've done a really fabulous work here. Um, I sincerely hope, I know you work with Sky News and uh, you're probably around cameras. I'm just like, did you bring a documentary film crew with you? Because this would be um, an incredible documentary <laughs> and a vital thing. Not everyone can read a book this big or listen to a podcast this wonky. Um, if not, you know, can you? Watch will this you? space. Watch this. Watch this space. There may there may be more more stuff to come. So that's Wonderful. What I'll say. Wonderful. Okay, Ed. Listen, thank you again for making the time. Uh, a real pleasure to uh, to read your book, to chat with you, to meet you in this uh, chip and uh, fiber optic cable enabled way. Um, looking forward to uh, maybe meeting you in person, in person one day and, and again, watching this, uh, this documentary. Pleasure. Thanks, Chris. All the very best.